This week on American Farm and Country Today, Doc Sanders introduces us to Jill Michael and Jean Gailey from Cedar Bog, and we discuss protective wetlands. Also, Doc Sanders catches up with Joe Biesecker as he introduces us to the legend of John Chapman, better known as Johnny Appleseed. All this week on American Farm and Country Today. Hi, I'm Doc Sanders, and today I want to share with you an American hero in my mind, somebody that contributed a lot to our culture and that sort of thing, and his name was John Chapman. And I will bet every one of you are going to say, who in the world was John Chapman? Well, today I have with me Joe Biesecker, who is going to share with us who John Chapman was and what he did. Joe, would you share with us? Yes, I'd love to share with you. Now, John Chapman was born in uh, Lem Lemonster, Massachusetts, and uh, he, as he traveled west, he uh, was called initially uh, Appleseed John, and uh, people would see him coming down the road, and they'd say, here comes Appleseed John, and then uh, it got turned around, and they started calling him John Appleseed, and then it eventually became Johnny Appleseed. And that's, of course, the legend and the character that we know today uh, here in the uh, 20th century. So uh, he had a mission that he uh, wanted to take, and that was to uh, spread the information of his faith to uh, people that he would plant uh, nurseries for and people that he would plant orchards for as he traveled through western Pennsylvania and through Ohio and eventually into Indiana around the Fort Wayne area where he finally passed away. And uh, anybody that he would stay with or he would talk with, he would often say to them, I bring you great news fresh from heaven. And then he'd start talking about his faith, his faith in God and his faith in um, all the living things. He had, he had a feeling that God was in all living things, and so he felt very comfortable out in the woods by himself when he would be planting his nurseries. And, uh, but interesting, he would then, when he was with people, he was very sociable. And so he was, in that way, uh, hard to kind of figure out by people who try to uh, pigeonhole him in a certain kind of a category. He, uh, he was kind of a strange duck, wasn't he? Uh, 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 with the way he dressed and what he did and different things like that? Yes. Uh, some people, you often see, they'll say he was eccentric. And uh, when people tell me that, I say, uh, yeah, but aren't we all a little? So <laughs> he was being himself, I think. He enjoyed uh, clothes wasn't that important to him. He, he, was, he kept his clothes clean. He always had the rivers to wash things up. And, uh, but he would go barefooted which at that time, uh, a lot of people actually went barefooted. And his feet would get so callous, they were, they were tougher than shoes if he'd have worn shoes. But he would wear uh, hand-me-down clothing, and he would uh, sometimes wear his cooking pot on his head. That's uh, one of the things people like to argue about, did he or didn't he? Well, we have in our archives here at the uh, Learning Center that... Uh, uh, anecdotes of people who walked with him and observed him uh, wearing the pan on his head. Now, what he would do when it was a rainy day, uh, he would put a regular hat on, then he would fold up his religious papers, put them on top of that, and then he would put the cooking pot on top of that, and it kept his papers dry for uh, that day. Also, though, in the archives, there's lots of uh, references to if he wore it on his head down to the next nursery, that freed his hands up to carry his other equipment. So uh, those are some of the things uh, that people uh, consider himself, as you use the phrase, a strange duck. But uh, a lot of people, once they got to know him, they, they knew better and knew how he really was. You know, the thing is, it is so neat that he had uh, his niche that he was able to uh, be able to proselytize to people about his faith 
was the, the part about free land and fruit trees. Would you share with us that part of the story? Yes, his, uh, he had a business. Uh, he didn't uh, live off of people. If he stayed with people, he would work his, and pay for his stay. Sometimes he'd stay a few days a week and work on a nursery nearby. But people were always glad to have him stay because he would uh, do his share of work. And, uh, but he would, his business was to start nurseries, uh, small nurseries using actually seeds from apples. And he would get those seeds from cider mills where they would make the cider. And generally when you make cider, I know I grew up on a farm here in Dark County, Ohio. We made cider with our orchard from apples from our orchard. And when, my job was to take the apple pumice or apple mash that you finish up with and feed it to the pigs. They loved it. And of course, uh, people with cider mills, that's generally what they would do is throw it to the animals. But Johnny would sit down and say, could I pick the seeds out of it? And they didn't mind at all if he did that. Then he would dry them and bag them, literally big bags of seeds, and then go further west to start these nurseries. And it was called like a movable nursery. He, he just kept making more nurseries as he kept going western, all the way across western PA, all of Ohio, and into Indiana. And, uh, as he, and then he, as the seeds would sprout and grow into seedlings, then he would sell the seedlings to the settlers. Some of the settlers might not be able to afford them, and he was uh, very philanthropic and very giving, and he would say, uh, pay me when you can. And uh, some may have never paid, but that wasn't really a concern of his. He still made a good living from that. So, Joe, tell me, why is uh, Johnny Appleseed and his heritage so important today? Well, Johnny, uh, is a wonderful teacher. Just when so many teachers teach about Johnny in schools, particularly uh, schools, uh, I know the public schools aren't supposedly allowed to talk about religion too much and so on, but if you teach Johnny, it's all packaged right in there. So, we're, so a lot of uh, public school teachers teach about him, but also private schools, particularly religious affiliated schools, many of them teach about Johnny. One fell in Crystal Lake, uh, Illinois, which is near Chicago. He's a, he's a principal of a Lutheran school, elementary school. And on Johnny's birthday every year, which is actually coming up this month, September 26th, uh, he, the whole school just celebrates every class all day long, celebrates Johnny. And he always calls me every mo that morning and says, happy birthday, Johnny. <laughs> Have a good day. But uh, Johnny, of course, touched many communities. He was born back in Massachusetts and traveled throughout across New York and spent quite a bit of time in western Pennsylvania, most of his life in Ohio, and towards the end of his career in, uh, in uh, uh, eastern Indiana. And uh, through all of those places, uh, every time uh, people want have festivals with celebrating him uh, or write plays about him or music about him, uh, poems about him, uh, essays, and uh, any of those kinds of things, you're automatically helping to spread his gentle goodness and his loving ways and what a great heart he had. And so his mission, even though his, his goal was not to become a legend, his mission was to serve, and in, in turn then he became a legend through his graciousness and his loving heart and his gentle kindness. And uh, recently here at the Johnny Appleseed Education Center and Museum in Bailey Hall here, Historic Bailey Hall at Urbana University, we uh, received from the Doc family who were descendants of Johnny's uh, half-sister, Persis, uh, his uh, Bible that he carried with him towards the end of his life. and. Uh, show you that here. We're instructed to wear uh, white gloves when we handle it. We will be putting it on a permanent display here very shortly. Uh, we're waiting on some equipment we've ordered in order to make that display. But this is Johnny's Bible and uh, as I mentioned the uh, it was left with his uh, it was left with his sister Persis and her husband William Broom and then that came down through their daughter and on down to the Doc family 
uh, here in western Ohio and in the Dayton area, Dayton, Ohio area. But uh, Johnny carried, always carried his Bible with him. One of the things we read in the archives is that he always stuck it under his belt. And this shows that the, the wear and tear of that, uh, which is, um, fits accordingly to the information that comes down through the archival material. Also inside is uh, his sister's name, Persis, uh, dated 1849, I believe it is, I'm not sure. He died in 1845, so she would have gotten it then, but she may have been a few years before she finally wrote down her name in it. And there are some other, there are some other names in here that, uh, so we'll be putting this on display very soon uh, here in the museum, and we're pleased to share it here today with you, and uh, hope that uh, people, if they have questions or information uh, they want to share or, or questions they want to ask, well, we'd be glad to um, share or talk with them about Johnny's faith or this, the Bible in particular. This has been a wonderful day here on the campus of Urbana University. For more information. Yeah, you can contact us here at the Johnny Appleseed uh, Educational Center and uh, Museum. And we're uh, on the campus of Urbana University in the historic Bailey Hall, our oldest building here on campus. It's a museum in itself in that it's on the National Historic Registry. And you can, uh, or you might want to join our Johnny Appleseed Society or if you have information you'd like to share with us about maybe you're related to Johnny or you have uh, learned about some information um, that you'd like to share with us that we could include in our archive collection. Uh, we'd like, we do uh, regularly get to people come and call us and share with us information we didn't know about. And so anytime you have something like that, we, we certainly welcome it. So give us a call if any of those things uh, cross your mind. Thank you, Joe. I'm Doc Sanders. Food for Thought with Doc Sanders is brought to you by Plaka Resources, who remind you that Doc Sanders' complete guide to raising dairy feeder calves for show or market and other award-winning books are available online at vacaresources.com. We heard from Joe Biesecker today here at the Johnny Appleseed Museum about how Johnny Appleseed, would, as they made cider, would take the palmas and pick the seeds out of it before they threw the palmas to the pigs. He picked those seeds out and dry them and that sort of thing and later then go plant apple trees someplace else and nurture them until they were fruitful. How many times do we receive the message like that promise that we throw it away rather than taking that message and the spirit of it and plant it and nurture it and watch it grow? I'm Doc Sanders. Food for Thought with Doc Sanders is brought to you by Plaka Resources, who remind you that Doc Sanders' complete guide to raising dairy feeder calves for show or market and other award-winning books are available online at vacaresources.com.